So, good morning, everyone. So, my name is Hendrik Blum. I'm working here since about four weeks and quite now working uh, mostly on gallium arsenide, also silicon germanium spin qubits. For details, you can ask some people from my group here. And what I will mostly talk about is, well, essentially entirely, is quantum dot qubits and start with the basics, a little bit the historical development, mostly focused on gallium arsenide, but uh, I can assure you, even though there's good alternatives nowadays, uh, the very same physical principles apply to, for example, silicon qubits. So with this, you have a solid foundation, for example, for later lectures by Levin van der Seypen, I think, in the ETH cycle. So I'll start from basic concepts, how these qubits are operated, operations like readout, initialization, how they're manipulated, different techniques, and then focus a little bit on mostly coherence measurements and the hyperfine interaction, which is, well, one of the, or probably the biggest problem in the gallium arsenide, but also perhaps the most interesting piece of physics. I'd like to mention that many of the slides here, especially on single qubits, I've stolen from the group of Lee and Fender Seipen, so blame me for the mistakes I've added, but give credit to them. Now, why taking spin qubits? It's probably clear from any paper you read of them, it starts with something like a line. Semiconductor qubits are good because of their prospects for scalability. So it's a bit of a beaten argument, but it's certainly true that they're much closer to contemporary semiconductor technology like these guys than, for example, superconducting qubits. They're nice and small. And if you go through the numbers, it's actually not entirely crazy to fit roughly the number of qubits you need in order to do something interesting, like factorizing 1,000-bit numbers or doing interesting quantum chemistry calculations on a silicon chip roughly this big. So scalability in the long run seems favorable, but right now it's clear they're a little bit behind superconducting qubits. Then from an abstract point of view, you know that to realize qubits, you want to have ideally a two-level system. So what's more natural than a spin? It naturally has two levels, although even within spins, one sometimes deviates from that. And then in general, spins are, these in principle, quite weakly coupled to the environment. Uh, Spin-orbit coupling in some materials is weak. Um, you know that magnetic transitions in atomic physics are much weaker than electric dipole transitions. So in principle, that impro uh, implies good prospects for long coherence and high fidelity control. In fact, it's quite a bit easier, I would say, to get good spin qubits in the, from the material point of view than strong superconducting qubits. But of course, it's also weakness when you want to couple them. They don't talk to each other very well, so we'll see. Anyway, so the long-range vision that drives this field as much as many others is that at some point, we might have some kind of quantum I square root 2 processor coming out of the Intel fabs. Now, a few more historical approaches to spin qubits, but also spin. For example, in the NMR, you take molecules that have a chain of spins that are somehow exchange coupled in the, inside the molecule, apply appropriate pulses using more or less standard NMR spectrometers. And already in 2001, <coughs> one could factorize 15 with that. And that's you know, still, by the current state of the art, pretty impressive in terms of how, what qubits can do. Um, and the easy thing here in some sense is, of course, that your processor is given by nature. You don't need to build it up. But overall, the scalability is considered relatively poor on the one hand because to big, build big processors, you need longer and longer molecules. Also, you only have global controls. You can only control all qubits at once and not locally. You cannot really do fast readout. You only read out big ensembles. And then theoretically, because the polarization of nuclear spins, even at high fields and low temperatures, is pretty dismally small, you, um, the initialization of the qubits doesn't scale well, takes longer and longer, the bigger your quantum computer is to get a good initialization and good readout contrast. So there's also fundamental problems with this. Something that works very nicely are uh, defect centers. Here's just an overview, and you'll hear more of them partly in the lecture by Ronald Hansen on NV centers. He's the expert there. And probably Levin will also talk about phosphorus donors. He's just doing a sabbatical in the expert group uh, working on these. 
So phosphorus donors and silicons actually work in many ways, like quantum dots. Here you see, for the experts among you here, you see a transport diagram of current transport, which was always the first characterization measurement through individual donors in a device like this. You have a source and a drain, some donors in the middle, which act as individual sites, individual quantum states, or basically quantum dots, some gates over the top, and well, you start out doing such measurements, but then it was shown that you can manipulate these spins with very high fidelity. The fidelity numbers are in the high 99% range or mid 99%, probably limited by technique more than the devices themselves. And if you take the nuclear spin of these donors, so they have an electron spin, they have a nuclear spin. If you take the nuclear spins, T2 times of 30 seconds in such devices and three hours in the bulk have been shown. So these work very beautifully. Actually, other silicon approaches perform similarly. But then, of course, putting many of these next to each other and coupling them is a non-trivial challenge. So always, as you often have, there's a trade-off between long-term prospects for scalability, putting many qubits together, and the qualities of an individual qubit. And V-centers and diamond are vacancy of a carbon atom in the diamond lattice combined with a nitrogen atom nearby. And these have the exciting prospect that, first of all, their phonon coupling is relatively weak. So one can get pretty impressive T2s at room temperature. And moreover, you can easily read them out optically. They have the right kind of um, spectrum in the excited states, which makes them quite readily accessible. But again, putting many of these together in a reproducible way that they couple is an unsolved problem. And I would see them more as a playground for either small scale devices, maybe with up to 10 qubits. Perhaps coupling to optics works very nicely. And nice proof of principle platform for quantum information experiments. So, well, fundamental aspects, qualitative understanding, and so on. <laughs> All right, so what I'll talk about are quantum dots. Again, we are capturing individual or few electrons, but we are doing that in semiconductor structures. I'll say more about that partly through appropriate band structure and electrostatic gates. So the electrons are captured in a nice smooth potential. And as I said, I'll focus first of all on the general principle that apply to basically all low temperature semiconductor qubits, no matter whether it's these donor spins in silicon or whether it's um, silicon quantum dot, silicon germanium, gallium arsenide, uh, the basic ideas and techniques are all the same. Now, if you ask what's the pros and cons of gallium arsenide as one particular material system, first of all, it uh, has always served as the pioneering system and produced many of the legacy results, the first demonstration that, for example, manipulation and readout of a single spin or two is possible relies on a long history from semiconductor quantum transport experiments and therefore is a quite mature material system. So you may, for example, know that from quantum Hall physics, very high quality structures are available. And that's especially initially helped the community to get up to speed and build on these results. And it also has quite favorable electronic properties. For example, there's only a single valley. The problem with silicon is you have two valleys, so there's more states around, which makes things more complicated. And uh, the failure rate is still, well, non-zero, I would say. You have a small effective mass, which gives you big wave functions, and the lithographic size of the samples doesn't need to be too, too small. Uh, so big electrons, and also it has a direct band gap, so it lends itself quite well to optical interfacing, although with these structures, that's not demonstrated. However, it has one big drawback, and that drives much of the silicon effort that is happening, and that is uh, all the 3.5 semiconductors, including gallium arsenide, all isotopes have nuclear spins. These nuclear spins talk to the electrons, and well, if you don't pay attention, deface them quite quickly. So I would say, um, say more about that in the next lecture tomorrow. It's certainly a big overhead. It can be fun to play with them, on the other hand. Um, it's probably not an unsurmountable obstacle, but if you can get rid of the nuclear spins, life gets much easier or more boring, depending on what point of view. So it's also a nice physics play playground. And yeah, as I've said, uh, one very prominent alternative is the same thing in silicon, basically. All right, so, so much about the general overview. I'd like to now 
continue with uh, first a uh, bit more on the physical realization and the experimental setups that we are using. And then talk about single spin readout and control. And then towards the end, well, today probably come to two electron spin qubits where one uses two electrons rather than a single one, which has the advantage that one can use the exchange interaction between them to manipulate the qubit. And as you see, that makes some things a little bit easier and probably get as far as single shot readout. And then in the next lecture, focus more on decoherence and the interaction with nuclear spins using these two electron spin qubits where the most work has been done and happens to be my own expertise. Then probably at the end, certainly talk about two qubit operations, give a bit of an outlook on scalability, how I envision a scalable quantum computer based on these devices could look like. And um, what I need to fit in somewhere is yet another type of qubit that uses three spins and uses more exchange and less magnetic fields for control. All right, so let's move ahead to physical realization, experimental setup. So to start making a qubit, we ask our friends from the Gross uh, community for a nice wafer. In gallium arsenide, an aluminum gallium arsenide starts on a commercial wafer, then grows some gallium arsenide just to get rid of defects and so on. So up here, this is pretty passive. Just think of this as a nearly perfect crystalline gallium arsenide structure with defect densities that are as low as, well, about a few hundred nanometers, say 500 nanometers between individual charge defects. So it's among the most pure materials that you'll find on Earth comes to a concentration of 10 to the minus 13 per centimeter cube. So that's about 10 to the minus 8 um, impurity concentration. And also the dislocations, crystal defects, are very rare. Then you grow uh, some layer of gal aluminum gallium arsenide on there. This has a larger band gap. So if you look at the conduction band energy, we'll have this offset. This means that electrons rather like to stay on this side in the gallium arsenide than on the other side in the aluminum gallium arsenide. Well, conventionally to get electrons, you need doping, so you put in a little bit of silicon. The electrostatic potential then gets a kink once these are ionized, and then on top, uh, about 100 nanometers over this interface, you just put a gallium arsenide cap to prevent oxidation. So that, again, is perfect. One, one comment about the, this incredible material perfection uh, is it possible or conceivable that in the next few years it will be another order of magnitude or two better, and would that matter for your qubits? Okay, so, well, is it conceivable? If you look at quantum Hall, the mobilities, which is the, in that field the primary um, criterion for material quality, have gone up steadily from the millions to somewhere in the 40 million right now. And there's some nice papers where you see every time they add some more cryogenic cooling to their chamber, uh, they go on gain, I don't know, an order of magnitude or so. So I guess one can always do better, but it seems it gets ex excessively costly. So for example, you would replace nitrogen shielding to get good vacuum with liquid helium. And that's way more expensive. I already know the growers are complaining about too much nitrogen cost. Um, Purity is probably also in many ways at the limit. You can gain a little bit by dedicating your apparatus a little bit more, keeping all other species you don't want to have out, but you need some dopants. One thing I have ho high hopes for is that getting rid of the dopants altogether <coughs> will improve the quality, but not so much because the material gets better, it's just because these are disturbances in their own sake. Um, and in many ways, the material quality in terms of disorder, at least for gallium arsenide, is not a major hurdle, I would say. It's more switching noise, um, instabilities of the structure, so dopants moving around, electrons tunneling around, and that can be solved as undoped structures, we hope. In other materials, such as silicon, for example, though, uh, the community is still developing, the MBE growth is improving, and there I would expect that uh, significant improvements are possible and that may or may not overcome the limitations that the material faces right now. Oh, any other questions on that? Anyway, always feel free to interrupt if something catches your attention. We've got plenty of time. Um, it's good to have some discussion. So 
Anyway, so at the end of the day, uh, we start out with this band structure with a discontinuity. We have dopants here, and the electrons provided by the dopants have basically lower energy in this gallium arsenide region than the aluminum gallium arsenide, so they would accumulate here. But then the electric field arising from the ionized dopants, which are now positively charged, attracts the electrons, so it pulls them towards this interface. And in the end, you have a two-dimensional electron gas if you do things right, right at this band interface. Two-dimensional means here that all the Z di dynamics, so the degrees of freedom in this direction, are frozen out. So you see here indicated two levels from the Z quantization. The lowest one is below the Fermi level and occupied. You make sure the next highest level is above the Fermi energy by a few MeV, so at low temperatures it's completely unoccupied. So for all practical purposes, the electrons are completely two-dimensional and only move along this interface in the plane. So now you have a 2D metal, essentially, with some interactions, but they're not so important. Um, so next thing is to pat uh, pattern them. And for that, we use standard lithography that many of you will know from maybe your own work. Um, superconducting qubits rely much on the same thing with different materials. But for perhaps theorists amongst you, we first pattern some uh, photo or e-beam sensitive resist. It's basically a thin layer, 100 nanometers or so of plastics. Then shoot electrons at it and then develop it. So in all the regions where that have been exposed to electrons, the links have been chopped apart. So this gets removed. We have a gap. Then deposit metal on that. And currently, you still use some physicist technique with metal evaporation and subsequent lift off. So all the metal that lands on the resist gets washed away after the resist is dissolved. The stuff that lands, or metal that lands directly on the substrate stays there. It's not a particularly high yield process by the say, uh, standards of semiconductors, but works in the lab and is relatively simple. And so what we end up with then is the structure here with some patterned gates. Patterned happens on a scale of a few tens of nanometers, so that's the minimum size we can get. Here's a typical device design. If we now apply negative voltages to these gates, the negative voltage compared to the two deck locally repels the electron. So the electrons go away under the gates, and they stay around where there's no gate if you select the right voltages. And that way, you can generate first individual puddles or paths of electrons and eventually push this so far by tuning the gate voltage that only individual electrons are left. And as I'll tell you a little bit later uh, today, you can really count individual electrons and capture just one or two or any number you like. So at the end of the day, you have a device structure, again, that looks like this. Here's this barium arsenide band structure. And 100 nanometer, roughly below the surface, you have this potential that essentially more or less a quadratic confinement potential in the lateral direction that can confine one or two electrons. And since the potential is quadratic, it's a roughly Gaussian wave function, just as you know from elementary quantum mechanics. Um, so that's the most important thing that makes our qubits. And then there's additional features like this quantum point contact here. It's basically something like a transistor, but a very small one with an individual quantum state in the channel. And its conductance, just as in a field effect transistor, depends on the occupancy of the dot and can be used to read out the qubit. Or you can use or also use other quantum dots for readout, which works a little bit better. So any questions on the sample, what they look like, how they are made? Yes? What do you need the uh, for? Right, so the question is, what do I need the dopants for? Basically, to provide the electrons. If you don't have the dopants here, then this kink in the electrostatic potential wouldn't be there, because you have no charge. This would be flat. And then it turns out, partly due to a high density of states at the surface, at least in gallium arsenide, Normally, you wouldn't have electrons here, so no qubit to start with. If you put a broad, large gate over the top and bias that positively, you can also induce electrons, but making contacts is a little bit harder. So this is just starting to be explored, but it's not a well-established technique. It's much easier to just start with the dopants, which populate the two deck, no matter what you do up here. What are the thicknesses? So thicknesses, total is about, maybe let's go back here, 
This is a typical structure, about 100 nanometers below the surface of the two deck. You need to be relatively close. Um, if you go too far, then the, well, the potential variation from these top gates smears out as you go into the sample, and you can't control your potentials anymore, so going much further than 100 nanometers is not a good idea. On the other hand, you want some distance between the doping and the two deck that reduces disorder. Dopants always produce disorder. The further away they are, the smoother the potential gets. So typically you have some 40 to 60 nanometers to the doping and then the rest of the 100 nanometers are on top. And once you make that much thinner, the devices tend to become a little bit unstable. There's some work with, say, 60 nanometer deep two decks, but this is the standard design. Anything else? All right, so then a few words on the experimental conditions. They're very similar to, well, most other solid state qubits, especially the bigger ones. Uh, they need very low operating temperatures in the millikelvin range, so we use dilution refrigerators. And you know, on some broad level, it would of course be nice to go to higher temperatures, but high temperatures meet larger energy scales. All the energy scales need to be bigger. If you want to make energy scales big, you need to make size is small. Um, so, for example, the uh, Coulomb energy interaction between electrons is inversely related to the size. The level space splitting goes as 1 over size squared. So, if you want to have reasonably manageable big structures that are much bigger than atom, where you have very large energy scales, of course, then you end up with fairly low energy scales, and it means you need to go to low temperatures. So, there's always a price to pay to move on the temperature <coughs> scale. So here's a dilution refrigerator that, well, it can't be seen very well, but all this piping essentially uh, works like a kitchen fridge but gets you to temperatures of a few tens of millikelvin. Then the sample is placed in a cold finger here. So this is a stick that sticks out from the refrigerator into a magnet, a superconducting magnet used to apply magnetic fields. Um, and then, well, here you don't see all that much. There's a copper enclosure just to keep uh, noise out. And then in this cold finger, we place a sample board for RF connections. Um, this isn't quite the latest generation, but still gives you an idea. You have some high frequency lines coming in here, a uh, script line for readout. Then the qubit chip sits in the middle here. This is about 5 by 5 millimeters. And then a bunch of DC lines that provide static voltages and some capacitors to uh, filter the voltages and so on. Am, am I correct that uh, this, the refrigerator on the left looks like a quote, small refrigerator? Is that true? This is, you know, this refrigerator is about, well, one meter roughly is the scale in height and 10 centimeters diameter. It's the standard size for wet dilution refrigerators. It has been the technology, standard technologies up to a couple of years ago. Nowadays, it's become fashionable and convenient to just buy Refrigerators that don't need liquid helium, you plug them into the wall, and because they're designed differently, they don't go into a liquid helium bath, you can make them bigger, and it becomes roughly three times as big. For the qubits themselves, it hardly makes a difference. It makes it a bit easier to install high-frequency components then. So the stack height is more or less unchanged, but it's the, the stack, stack Exactly. It's yeah. so they get wider. The stack height is... If anything, it gets a little bit bigger as far as the cold part goes, but you don't make all that much use of it. It's mostly the lateral size that you get from having larger cold plates. Right, any questions? Or? Yeah, so these high frequency lines, maybe, you see they're not the most advanced designs. These are just coaxial cables that here we soldered onto the chip, and then the last bit here is not impedance matched. That carries to a few hundred megahertz, maybe gigahertz, but if you want to go to uh, really uh, tens of gigahertz frequencies, then of course these lines need to be carried impedance matched all the way to the chip, and if needed, that's certainly done. Um, this is just what I had available. It's actually one of the, you know, in some way, potential advantages of these qubits. A lot of the control, or some of the control techniques, happen really between zero DC and 500 megahertz. So the RF engineering becomes less challenging than, or less, well, advanced than what one needs for superconducting qubits. 
And if one really thinks of scalable approaches where you have local control electronics and don't want to have expensive equipment sitting on the rack that uses more electricity than even your refrigerator, perhaps that could turn into an advantage. But on the other hand, you have many, many DC lines. If you look at superconducting qubits, there's maybe one or two that you need to control and lots of microwave lines. So basically all the control goes through one or two lines. Here we have many more connections. So there's a trade-off, and who knows what will work in the end. All right, so these you've probably seen a gazillion times, so I won't tell you what a qubit is, but nevertheless, they are good motivation of what I'll discuss next. First of all, well, we need a qubit that we've discussed, so we can check that off. What I'll now basically focus on is the basic control. How do I initialize? manipulate and read the qubit, and as I said, coherence and fidelity will come in the next lecture. So I'll go through first some well, the standard techniques for signal spin control, and then later on move on to two electron spin qubits that use these two electrons together to encode one qubit. So here you see one quantum dot, here it only has one single qubit, uh, or one single electron spin. This electron spin is coupled to a reservoir, so just an area of two deck, basically a two-dimensional Fermi C that it can tunnel into and out of. You'll see why. There's gates, and to one gate you can apply voltage pulses. And then there's again this quantum point contact here, this channel through which you send a current. And if there's an electron here, it repels the electrons in the channel, so the transport through this channel is reduced and you measure less current. So what this basically allows you is to get a readout of the charge state of this quantum dot, whether there is an electron or not. What I'll tell you now is how that can be used to read spin information. Here the qubit is operated at a large field of about 10 tesla, which you can get quite comfortably from a superconducting magnet, and that means that the electronic Zeeman splitting, so the splitting of the spin space states in the external field, is much bigger than the temperature which is important to energetically resolve them. So how is this operated? What you see up here is on the one hand the voltage at this uh, plunger gate. And here it starts out with both levels, the spin up and the spin down level above the Fermi energy. This is the Fermi C in the reservoir. So that means if there's an electron, it will tunnel out. And we empty the qubit, the quantum dot. And now the current level reflects that. It says us there's no electron in the dot. Next, we apply voltage, or well, they apply voltage. They pull both levels below the Fermi energy. So first of all, you see a change in the current because the current also reacts to the voltage on the gate here. It's also an electrostatic effect. But then at some point, determined by the tunneling rate on average, an electron can tunnel into the dot. And since both states, spin up and spin down states, are below the Fermi energy, uh, they can both be filled. You have occupied states here and at this energy. So both are filled roughly with the same probability, even though they have different energies. And that's just a random mixture in this case. And what you see once these tunnel in is that now an electron sits here. It restricts the current flow. So you see the current dropping down by this uh, electron entering. So you see when electron tunnels into the dot, typically happens on a scale of, or set so that it happens on a scale of a few microseconds to milliseconds. So you can accumulate enough signal. Maybe something to think about. What would you do if you only want to initialize a well-defined spin state? So here we initialize a mixture. Up and down are occupied with equal probabilities. How could you change that to only have one species? Exactly. So if you now, if you put on less voltage, such that only a spin down is below the Fermi energy and the spin up is above the Fermi energy, only one state would be initialized. And here you already see that um, the Zeeman splitting needs to be bigger. If the uh, energy separation is less than the smearing of the Fermi function here of the Fermi edge by thermal energy, this wouldn't work. Any questions there? Or 
Okay, so the question is how is this current depending on whether there's an electron? So if you go deeper into the, well, how to think of this formally, mm -hmm. it's basically a smooth potential, but it's a potential barrier that electrons need to flow across or tunnel through. And if you raise this barrier, so let's do that on the board. So this, if you take a cross section along this arrow here, you have a potential barrier here, you have the Fermi C. This would be the Fermi energy, so electrons are all the way over here and over here, and to get through there, they need to tunnel through this barrier. And now, if you move an electron into the dot, that repels electrons that want to be here, so they raise the potential, just the negative, uh, well, well, negative potential from that electron. So the barrier gets bigger here, and that means the tunneling is reduced and the current decreases. And that effect turns out to be big enough to be measured with standard techniques on a scale of, well, as I say, microseconds to milliseconds. Well, does that answer that? Yeah. Yeah. So, next step would be to, if we now want to read out what is the state of the electron, <coughs> we do exactly the same thing that we just discussed for initializing a particular state. So we push the levels to a le uh, or the two states to such a level that one is below the Fermi energy and the other one is above. Now you distinguish the two cases. If you are in the spin up state, in the ground state, then you're still below the Fermi energy, nothing happens, and you see just a flat current response. This step here is the direct coupling from the gate to the channel, so you can ignore it and nothing else happens. On the other hand, if you were in the spin down state, in the excited state, then the spin jumps out because it's above the Fermi energy. But next, a spin can tunnel in because now the dot is empty. And it's actually the Coulomb repulsion that prevents the second electron from tunneling in before. So there can only be one electron on the dot uh, at any time in this regime. And so what you see then in the charge sensor response is that for some amount of time, the current first goes up as the electron tunnels out and then drops again as the next one comes in. And this little blip here, the increase and decrease of the current, tells you that the electron was in an up state. So, and then at the end, you repeat the cycle, you can throw the electron out again, you're back here, and the whole thing starts again. And then you can repeat this many times to get averages. <laughs> And notice also that at the end of this cycle, you're always in the spin-up state because the spin-down uh, state has tunneled out and the spin-up has come in again, which means that at the end of the readout, you've also initialized your electron in a particular spin state, as we've discussed before. So this also covers the initialization. So, okay, this is all theory so far, or concept. Now here is some experimental data that just implements that. These are the same traces I've shown here, but now taken in the lab, as I say, on a millisecond time scale. Most of this is just response to the gate, but this little blip here is the response of an up electron or down electron. So you can now label this one as an up state and this one as a down state. If you repeat this experiments many times, you get statistics on the two probabilities. And well, you know, some time ago, about 10 years old, the result, and was one of the hallmark experiments that really started the age of quantum dot spin qubits. It was quite a remarkable realization then that you can really read the spin state of a single electron. Um, but it still is the <coughs> technique that is used basically for all the, with some variants, for all the single spin qubits in this quantum, of this quantum transport kind. Any questions on that? All right, so what can we do with that? Of course, the first thing you do if you have a qubit or something that might be a qubit is to try to learn something about its properties. And one thing you can, you can do directly with this technique without any additional control is to measure the relaxation time of the spin. So we've already seen that we can initialize a mixed state of up, up, plus, down, down, so roughly 50-50 density matrix. And if you just wait now for 
some time after initializing. So basically, in this step here, um, after this step, you just wait in this configuration for some time. Then the ground state should stay the same. The excited state here should decay. And we can measure how fast this decays. Here you see a typical measurement. So you see that the spin down fraction that gives these little blips decays as a function of waiting time. If you do that at these high fields of 10 Tesla, this is uh, time scale here is about one millisecond. So you might say, well, can one do better? Not so exciting. But it turns out if you do the same measurement with a somewhat different technique to work at low fields as a function of magnetic field, then you find the dependence of the relaxation rate on the fifth power of the B field. That is typical for the relaxation mechanism due to spin orbit coupling and phonon emission. What goes in there is that as you reduce the splitting, the energy scales become smaller and there's fewer and fewer phonon states available that you can give the energy to. So therefore, the relaxation time goes up. This that gives you a few powers here for similar reasons because it involves well, higher excited orbital states, the level splitting in the dot goes in as a fourth power, so it depends a lot on how strong your confinement is. And, well, the exciting result is that if you go to low fields, relatively low of about one Tesla, which is actually a pretty typical upgrading field for many other purposes, if you don't need to have <laughs> splitting, then you have T1 times that are on the scale of about one second. So for many practical purposes, you can basically completely ignore T1 relaxation and think of it as infinite. At some point, we probably have to come back to that, but it's not really a main issue in many experiments. Did the history of this really go this way, that the initial experiments in the mid-2000s were at high fields, and then it was realized that other, for various reasons, you don't want to work at 10 Tesla, and then this sort of Tesla and sub-Tesla became... In well, partly. So, you know, the initial experiments, the electron temperature is always a bit difficult to cool electrons. They like to heat up a lot, heat much above the base temperature of the dilution refrigerator. So if you really had your electrons at 20 millikelvin, you could go down to a 6 gigahertz, and that's what, uh, about one Tesla splitting um, could work. But often the electrons are hotter, also it depends on noise in the sample, noise on lines. So for this energy selective readout, you probably need to be at a few Tesla, not necessarily at 10. But back then, 10 was the easiest. Um, and you know, different groups work on this. This result is actually from a different group at MIT. And they used a different readout method, which probably relates to quantum Hall physics in some way, but isn't really fully understood. But here, it's not so much the energy selectivity, but it turns out that for some reason, the up states and the down states tunnel out at different rates. So one exits faster than the other. So if you set your measurement time uh, on a time scale intermediate to these tu two tunneling rates, you will typically see that one state tunnels out and not the other. And since this now doesn't rely on the Siemens splitting, it was quite easy to go to lower fields. And well, in, then there's different readout techniques that will come to soon that don't need to have this hard, large Siemens splitting, but use two electron states, and then you're completely free in field and can go down to 10 millitesla or anything you like. So, so much about reading. Now we come to manipulation, yes? So can I ask about, uh, it's showing the spin down fraction. Uh -huh. It starts at 0.5, and then exactly. so. Ideally, you would start at 0 0.5, because it should be in a perfect world 50-50 mixture. Um, visibility is always an issue. It's never where you want it to be, uh, or it's hard work to get it there. Um, so for example, well, if now the lower energy state tunnels in a little bit more frequently, um, then you would already, or your relaxation already starts a little bit during the initialization before you even are at zero, then you basically don't have the full 50-50 and start at 30%. You'll often see, especially in the earlier work, that even sometimes you even have unscaled signals or just uh, visibilities that are much less than perfect. And in most cases, it's just that people haven't gone through the work of nailing that completely down and explaining it. So, yeah, good point. So now control, and for that, um, 
Now, since I, I suspect that there may just be a handful of you who are not completely familiar with the block sphere in your dreams, you should get there in the field of quantum information. It's a very useful tool for understanding any single qubit experiment, so I'll briefly introduce that. So any pure quantum state of a two-level system, so any superposition of your two computational states can be represented as a point on the surface of a sphere. So you typically put the basis states, your computational states on the North Pole, and then the different superposition states on the equator. The phase here, whether it's a plus, minus, i, minus i, or anything else, determines your geographical longitude, so to speak, and the probabilities here are the latitude. And if you think of these as spins, then the direction of the arrow from the center to your point is just the direction that your spin kind of classically points into uh, in space. So there's a direct mapping between kind of a real, the intuition of a real spin pointing in some direction and this block sphere representation. For other qubits, it's just an abstract mapping, but you can still think in the same terms. And then for later on, when we discuss the coherence, you can also represent mixed states that way, so that to some extent contain a prob uh, probabilistic mixture. And such mixed states are then points inside the Bloch sphere. So for example, here it's a quarter, zero, zero, and three quarters of one, one. And the distance, well, the direction still gives which are the two states that are mixed, the two, well, eigenstates, so to speak. And the length of this arrow, whether it's close to the center or close to the surface, tells you what are the probabilities. So if you're on the surface, it's a probability one to be exactly in this state. If you're in the center, it's a 50-50. And well, anything in between is some other combination of probabilities. Questions on that? Then you can also manip or visualize manipulation of qubits that way. You know that to manipulate qubits, you need to execute arbitrary unitary operations. And for signal qubit operations, this all applies to individual qubits. These uh, unitaries can always be visualized as rotations on the block sphere. So you rotate the whole sphere. That corresponds to some SU2 unitary. So there's a mapping between SU2 and SO3. Um, in principle, you need arbitrary ones, but of course, once you have two axes of control and can rotate through a variable or variable arbitrary angles, you can co always combine that to generate unitaries you like. Now, how do you generate rotations? If you have a general two-level Hamiltonian, this is the most general relative up to a, a trace that I've taken out, general part of the Hamiltonian, take a sum of the sigma matrices or write them onto the components, individual components like this, then this Hamiltonian corresponds to a rotation around the axis that's just given by the omega vector. And you see that by varying the different coefficients, you can generate any rotation axis you like. If you have a single spin, these omegas just correspond to the corresponding Zeeman splitting. So the direction of the rotation is just given by the magnetic field, which corresponds to the Lamo precession around the field. So nothing else than what you know from spinning bike tires or, well, classical gyros in a magnetic field. So that still works in the quantum mechanical regime. So basically all about single qubit control is generating these rotations and then of course the readout, which state am I in? Now there's one technique that is widespread that all quantum info people should know and understand in their sleep as well, and that is Rabi control. So often you cannot, well, in principle, you could generate rotations by just tilting this axis, for example, switching between having it in this direction and this direction. But often one axis is fairly large in the gigahertz scale. For example, if you're a large external magnetic field, you cannot just tilt it by a major angle. So, uh, or you have a level splitting between a transmon at a few gigahertz, you cannot manipulate that. So what one does instead is to apply a small AC field that is transverse to the original level splitting. This can be abstract, just a coefficient of the sigma x term in the Hamiltonian, or really a magnetic field in the horizontal direction. And it turns now, if you do that resonant with the precession of the spin around here, if, well, if your spin, say, 
points towards the right in this direction. Then it processes around one axis. Now the spin goes around. Your field also turns around. And if you face that right, you will find that the spin always moves further away from the uh, original state. From say it started in the one state, it always moves further away. So you will find that the spin does a spiraling motion looking like this, which arises from the synchronization of the driving field with intrinsic spin precession. And well, you already see that you can move the spin from the one to the zero state. Now this is a little bit messy to always take that, but a useful technique is to, to go into the rotating frame that rotates along with the modulation of this external field here. And then it turns out that you're back to a static Hamiltonian with the omega x component that's proportional to this driving strength, a z component that's com proportional to the difference between the driving frequency and the Zeeman splitting of the qubit. And you see that now in this lab frame, or this rotating frame, you can, by tuning these components, generate arbitrary rotations. And then at the end, you transform back to the lab frame, and which is, in the end, trivial, and have gained arbitrary control. So you learn that by applying AC, for example, magnetic fields to spin, or AC control fields to other systems that couple to, for example, sigma x, you can get arbitrary control. And furthermore, you see that the axis here depends on the difference between the level splitting and the frequency. So that gives you one control knob. Uh, this axis depends on the magnitude of the driving field. And furthermore, one can show that if you change the phase of the driving field, so the phase relation between the original spin precession and your driving field, you can also rotate around different axes. So you automatically get full control over which axis you're rotating around. Any question on the concept there? So let's apply that to single spins. Here, the Siemens splitting is given by an external field. We now need an in-plane field to drive the spin. At least that's the conceptually simplest approach. And well, here's the way, one way to do that. You start with a quantum dot. Actually, it's a double quantum dot. I'll come to Y, but just think of it as a single one for now. Again, you can apply pulses to the gates. Then you put a big strip line on top of that. So these are two conductors, actually would be a slot line in this case, uh, that is shorted at the end. So you send a current through here that can go up to the microwave regime. This current generates an Ørsted field. You know, it has field lines that wrap around like this. So the AC field in the region of the dot is out of plane. The external field can be in plane. So you just have those two orthogonal fields, one AC modulated, one static. And so you can use that to drive the spin. So in principle, you could combine that with our readout scheme and should be able to see then that you're driving up spins from down spins and vice versa, see these Rabi oscillations and so on. Well, practice is not quite so simple. And that comes back to what we discussed before. Um, in order for this to work, you need a high Zeeman energy in order to have the spin splitting. So that end means you end up at high frequencies in the you know, several gigahertz regime, depending exactly how cold your electrons are. But then these dot states tend to be also quite sensitive to electric fields. If you generate high frequency magnetic fields, you also have electric fields, partially intrinsic, partially parasitic. And that means you're likely going to kick out your electron by a process called photon-assisted tunneling, basically wiggling on the electron here gives it enough energy to jump out of the dot, even if it is below the Fermi energy. Um, so this direct combination is not so simple, and therefore they didn't use that. Instead, they used a second electron in this second dot here. And now you can compare the two spin states of the electrons and basically use one spin or one electron as a magnetometer to determine the state of the other. And I'll explain the details of that in a more formal way later when we come to two electron spin qubits that relies on exactly the same thing. But um, in a nutshell, you now measure transport of the average current through these dots. And if, let's see, the two spins are parallel, so you have one spin already on the dot. And if they're anti-parallel, one an additional electron can first hop onto the left dot. Now, when they're anti-parallel, they can occupy different quantum states. 
uh, or they can occupy the same orbital states, so it's a relatively low energy. The electron can move on and hop out again. So let's do that again. Antiparallel electrons just can flow through the dot. On the other hand, if you have a parallel spin, then to put that, it can, the parallel spin can go into the left dot. This one was already there. If we now want to move this to the right and then on to the next reservoir, this would have to go to an excited state because it cannot ex occupy the same orbital state. And if this state is above this energy, it doesn't, or above the original energy, it doesn't have the energy to get there, so the current flow will be blocked. Uh, this blocking is called the Pauli principle or spin blockade. And what happens, first of all, if you just set up this dot so current can, in principle, flow, so the energy alignment is shown here, that you, in principle, have always downhill flow in energy from the reservoir to the drain or from the source to the drain. Then at some point, an up electron will jump in, and it is blocked, and the current flow stops. So if you just wait for a few cycles, typically this flow is at a few megahertz rate, so you wait a microsecond at most, then you have two up electrons. Different way of initializing, somewhat stochastic, but will eventually block. Two down electrons would do the same thing, so you don't know if you're really an up up or down down, but you know you have one of these two states. Now you can apply your driving field and manipulate them. And this is the experiment I'll show. What you see first of all here is the current flow through this double dot so far without any RF, so just as a function of magnetic field. If you had low magnetic fields here, then it turns out these different spins can tumble about, especially nuclear spins, and that means this blockade is lifted, so it doesn't stay in the up-up state, can do an up-down state and then continue to flow. So you see current flow, but at reasonably large magnetic fields, the up-up or down-down states are stabilized, stay that way, and you see a very small current here through the dot. Now let's switch on RF say at from fixed frequency, then it turns out at some additional um, magnetic field that turns out to be resonant with this frequency, you see additional fields or additional peaks in the current, and that happens because now the field is resonant with a spin transition, and if you start an up-up, for example, you drive one of the spins, flip them into a down state, and switch on the current flow. If you do that as a function of magnetic field, you see indeed that the Frequency increases linearly with this magnetic field, and the corresponding electron G factor is just in the ballpark of what is expected for these structures. It's less than in free space because of the interaction with the host material, and the confinement reduces it beyond even the, or a little bit below the bulk value. So here we can do spectroscopy. We can see these transitions whenever it's resonant with the transition, uh, the state of the qubit changes. One can do better and do a pulse experiment and see how fast the spin rotates as a function of pulse duration, which one needs for full control. Experiment gets a little bit more complicated. It's the same setup again, but now we also use a pulse on these um, gates. So we start again in this configuration where electrons flow. And by me, I really mean the, we mean the people who've done the experiments. I didn't know anything about qubits back then yet. So at some point, again, an up spin comes along and is blocked here and cannot go to the other dots. And now we've completed the initialization. We don't know when that happens. We just wait for some time until it happens on average. Now we change with the voltage pulse here the levels such that now both two electron states on the right dots are above this energy. So now we know they're safely locked in separate states. And now we can drive our spin, shine microwaves through this antenna, so to speak. It's not really antenna in a strict sense, but, well, it generates a magnetic field. We split one flip one spin, and if this was successful, it can now, when we bring the electrons back to the original position, the current can flow. So we see electron transfer. On the other hand, if we rotate it further or didn't rotate at all, it will still be blocked and no current will flow. So then, if the current is measured as a function of the time the microwaves are applied, you see that the average current flowing through the two dots varies as a function of the burst time. You see the sinusoidal oscillation. I'll mention in a bit why it's not exactly sinusoidal. 
Uh, again, the maxima correspond to electron current flow possible. The minima correspond to no flow possible. And so this reflects the rotation of our spin. Then you can do that as a function of all sorts of parameters. So for example, if you vary the power of the, or the voltage amplitude of the AC voltage or AC current that you apply, so the strength of the B1 field, you see that, so again, in the, along the x direction here, this is the time that is varied. Um, so you see these oscillations in color code. This is just a current. You see that the more power, the more amplitude apl you apply, the faster the oscillations go. Here it's the same thing again. And it turns out that this frequency, which is called the Rabi frequency, so the frequency with which the spin is transitions between the up and the down state, is proportional to the current you have here. But now if you look closely and are used to, for example, superconducting qubits or more modern qubits, this isn't quite sinusoidal. It has this very strong initial decay and then some petering out oscillations. It's not quite exponential. It's also a funny shape with dips here. And it turns out that all that can be understood from fluctuating nuclear spins. There's nuclear spins in the dot that change the magnetic field. More on that tomorrow. And sometimes it's resonant, sometimes it's less resonant. The Rabi frequency changes. And if you average over these nuclear spin fluctuations, you get a curve like this. So that already hints at what the problem with these type of qubits are. But it basically works. All right, maybe five minute break or so to catch, wake up. All right, so let's continue with spin control. So we've just seen that it's in principle possible to use on-chip magnets, basically, or coils, very simple half-loop coil to generate AC magnetic fields and use that for spin manipulation. But it's not ideal, has a number of drawbacks. First of all, you see that this strip line or slot line is much bigger than your dots. So it's a bit hard to imagine having several of them, each with their own signal going to many qubits in a row. The currents that we use here are there was in the milliamps at high frequencies are pretty big currents. The heat uh, burns a lot of power. You can maybe do that with one qubit, but if you do it with millions, the fridge will get pretty hot and you run into cooling power issues. Then, as we've already seen with the readout, sending a big magnetic field or big current for magnetic fields through here typically also generates electric field due to inductances due to the resistance, and that affects the dot. You can partially tune that away, but it's still uh, cumbersome. You always have heating, both, um, well, just through the power dissipated, but also by just these RF fields heat the two deck. And furthermore, the magnetic fields are difficult to localize. They, well, just penetrate most materials, and it's not convenient to put magnetic shields down there. So if you talk to this qubit, you also talk to the other one. In fact, someone already asked, um, do you only drive one spin? In fact, in these experiments, you typically drive both spins, provided both are on resonance. So magnetic fields, there's a number of reasons to want to move away from that and instead use electric fields. If you can do that, somehow apply an electric field to here. You can use an existing gate, and electric fields can be screened more easily, um, and therefore it's much more uh, easier to locally address the qubits. But how do we use an electric field to manipulate spins? One basis is spin-orbit coupling. So I'll give you a very brief introduction how spin-orbit coupling works in semiconductor systems. If you have a moving electron moving with some velocity v in a magnetic field, external magnetic, well, no, actually in an external electric field, then special relativity tells you that electric fields are turned into effective magnetic fields in the moving frame of the electron. And that effective magnetic field is perpendicular to the velocity and the electric fields. And now since you're in a solid state in a lattice with microscopically many nuclei around, which generate fairly big electric fields, there's plenty of electric fields to generate these effective magnetic fields. So as soon as an electron moves, it sees this effective magnetic field just proportional to the velocity of motion. If you now move it for some direction, for some time, you know that the uh, rotation angle that the electron moves or rotates in this effective magnetic field is proportional to 
the magnetic fields times the time, so it's the Lama precession, magnetic field is proportional to velocity. So over, overall, it turns out the rotation is proportional to the distance covered. So if you take your electron, move it back and forth, along with that, at least without an external magnetic field, you see that it basically does this. So as whenever it moves, it also rotates. And um, because of this cancellation here, it turns out that the rotation angle is just a function of position. And OK, so that's what happens to the electron spin. Now let's switch on external magnetic field. On the one hand, that of course wants to align the electron. But if you go into the frame, reference frame, or spin reference frame, rotating along with the electron, you have an external field and your electron moves and rotates in this way. So in this frame, it looks like the external field toggles back and forth. Mm -hmm. So what you've done in the effect is from this motion here, this generated transverse driving field. So this perpendicular component to the external field, just what you need to drive the electron. And you can use that to generate spin rotations. Put into equations, you have a spin Hamiltonian that looks like this. You have the external field, you have this transverse driving field. So perpendicular to the external field that is time dependent. You can write down the components of this n vector, which gives the time dependence. They are depend on the position in x and y of the electron. These alpha and beta are so-called Rushbar and Dresselhaus terms that, well, are basically non-zero. The length scale here typically corresponds to a few micrometers. So if you move your electron, well, depending on the material, in gallium arsenide, it's a few micrometers. In some materials, it's more, some less. But it means if you move the electron by a few micrometers, it changes orientation modes. So now we can um, use an electric field to move the electron back and forth. And through this mechanism, this electric field is transformed into a magnetic field. So you apply a sine wave here this to one of the gates that shifts this confinement potential, and the electron will niggle back and forth. And again, we see Rabi oscillation. The rest of the experiment is pretty much the same. You apply a millivolt scale electric field now, burns much less power. In this case, it's a higher frequency. And it turns out that here, the fastest pi pulse you see is in about 110 nanoseconds. That gives you a measure of how, well, how fast and therefore how accurate the control operations are. For comparison, if we were back here, you had pi rotation about 50 nanoseconds, so it's not quite as fast, but comparable. Yeah. That's right. So we're basically probing the current from here. This is a two deck area. Yeah. So we contact the two deck, then the current flows from the two deck into the dot, next dot, and back to the two deck and the current. <laughs> Um, so if you ask how we make contact to the qubit at Tudek, um, in these doped structures, one basically puts the right kind of mixture of metal on top, heats it up to about 450 Celsius, and the metal diffuses a bit into the Tudek and creates a so-called ohmic contact, a kind of far away here millimeters away on the corners of the chip. It's exactly like through this contact into the two deck, then going through and then uh, back. Good question. It's a little bit harder if you use undoped structures because then extending the two deck to the contact is a bit tricky. You can ask uh, Simon over there how that works. <laughs> or sometimes doesn't. <laughs> All right, so here you see that Spin orbit fields can be used to um, drive spins. Um, in gallium arsenide, that hasn't really established itself so far as a qubit control technique, but it's still nice to know that it works. And sometimes it's a parasitic effect that you don't want to know. It works much better in materials um, with a lower band gap. Indium arsenide wires, for example, the Delft people might know a lot about that. Um, there you can drive much faster uh, rotations because spin orbit coupling is stronger. This micron scale difference distance there shrinks to something like 50 nanometers or so. But for some reason, the coherence also suffers in these devices, and overall, the fidelity isn't really any better. So, um, well, anyway, you also see that again as before, the Rabi frequency, the speed here is proportional to the driving amplitude. Relate to the electric field. 
but more interesting, you see that the bigger the magnetic field, the bigger the Rabi driving. And this happens because this transverse magnetic field, it happens from rotating the original field. Therefore, it's proportional to the external magnetic field. And um, then, well, you see basically faster driving, the higher your external field is, and therefore also the higher your resonance frequency is. So this axis here is equivalent to magnetic field because they are external magnetic field because they're related. So this is a hallmark of a spin orbit mechanism as opposed to any other driving mechanism. All right, questions on that? All right, then I'd like to come to yet another basically artificial type of spin orbit coupling, where again you couple the spin and orbital degree of freedom, but not through material property, but by engineering the environment. And that is still developing and also used quite successfully for silicon qubits and applicable in the same way. Silicon intrinsically has much weaker spin orbit coupling than gallium arsenide, so what I said before doesn't really apply there or wouldn't work very well, or at least would be slow. But this thing you can also do, and the idea here is to take a micromagnet, basically a piece of cobalt or so, a few hundred nanometers big, place that next to the qubit, and then it turns out that, well, because this generates an inhomogeneous magnetic field, the all components of the magnetic field will depend on position at the side of the qubit or the electron. If you now again wiggle the electron back and forth with an electric field, then it sees from this motion in an inhomogeneous magnetic field, it sees an effective AC magnetic field. And again, that can be used if the directions are right to drive spin rotations. And there's just been a paper from the Taruccio group in Tokyo who has been pursuing this using optimized magnet design here. Otherwise, it's the same kind of device, looks a bit different, but two electrons here, quantum point contacts for readout. And they've shown that with basically just doing, getting the engineering right, one can generate Rabi oscillations, which also now look more exponential, still have a lot of noise, but um, and um, have pi pulse time, so inversion of an electron in about four nanoseconds. And if that is computed to gate fidelity or equivalent to the error rate, so how many times uh, do you have the wrong state after driving the electron, it's somewhere at 96%. And it's not quite where it needs to be for error correction, but it's a pretty respectable value for gallium arsenide qubits. And the same has been used in silicon qubits. As I say, Levin will tell you all about that um, with fidelities in excess of 90, 99%. All right, so a few words on coherence, just because you know, whenever you have a qubit, people ask, what's your coherence time? Um, why is coherence important? It's the memory, li um, well, memory lifetime of quantum states in the qubit. And um, also, if roughly, if you compare the gate speed to your coherence time, it tells you how much of its information does a qubit lose over the duration of a gate. And therefore, it's a measure of the control fidelity. So it's the most basic metric of qubit quality or performance metric. And if you now use these control methods that I've discussed to do coherence measurements, I'll tell you more about the details. But very briefly, these are T2 star measurements where the qubit is initialized, then rotates for some time and is then measured. Or one can do a spin echo where slow fluctuations are canceled out with an additional pi pulse. Then one measures T2 stars in the scale of a few tens of nanoseconds and T2 times with the echo on the scale of microseconds back in 2008. Uh, I would say this data isn't really understood, but we know much more about this in, for two electron spin qubits where the physics is basically the same, and that I'll talk more about tomorrow. So <coughs> details to follow. All right, so to summarize on single spin qubits, I've shown you one way, or actually two ways to read them out. One was this energy selective readout by bracketing the spin states around the Fermi energy. Um, the alternative is to use this Pauli readout, which can be refined further, more to come. And we've talked about various methods of Rabi control, uh, shown that it's possible with both magnetic and electric fields. One second is electric fields probably being the 
more viable long-term alternatives, at least when they are applied locally. And then you need either the spin-orbit interaction or micromagnets to turn electric fields into magnetic fields. I mean, there's alternatives, more, some less. But it means if you more move the electron by a few micrometers. Yeah, so the question is, are there optical approaches? There's a whole field of, um, well, a whole discipline, basically, controlling spins optically. Uh, so far, there's one important difference. Um, to do optical work or control optic, you need somehow address excitons, and, and they should be confined. At least they have coherent control, and that's something you don't get by these dots because the lateral confinement of the electric fields, if electrons are confined, holes are deconfined, so you don't easily get bound exciton states, but there are tricks on which can help there. Um, what one typically does is have small inclusions of a different material, for example, indium arsenide in the gallium arsenide matrix, and then you really have a band structure that goes like this in the um, valence band, like this in the conduction band, so you have a localized whole state. Maybe I'll just do that here. So your band structure looks uh, like this in the conduction band, like this in the valence band. Here you have electron states and whole states typically shown like this. And there you can basically play all these games optically. Um, completely different field. Single shot readout has been shown. It's beautiful that you can interface with photons and ship your information to the next cryostat, interfere different photons. Coherence times are stuck around three microseconds, partly probably because these dots are smaller. I suspect strain plays a role. And well, I'm not an optics expert, but I have some doubts that this optical control is a bit too fast and it's not as flexible as electrical will really ever turn into something scalable. But what I find quite exciting is the idea of bringing the two together. In fact, you know, Simon is starting to work on that, um, how one can optically couple two structures like these and combine the two type of systems. Any other questions? All right, so let's see, what do we have? What I want to continue with, but let's see how far we get. Oh, probably it makes at least sense to get started. It's two electron spin qubits, so I'll start with the motivation, and then the details will come tomorrow. Um, so basically, so far, we've always used a single spin as a qubit to represent one unit of quantum information. Now I'll come to encoding spin qubits in several spins. Um, first, want to discuss some general principles and ideas, then go through some detail in a somewhat more abstract but more experimentalist way through how the control, well, how the Hamiltonian level, energy levels of the systems look like and how that is used to control the qubit. Say a little bit about the technical details, how one can actually capture individual electrons, which often is swept under the rug nowadays, but important when you want to start an experiment like that. And at some point then discuss single shot readout, how one can do high fidelity, faster readout, which I think is pretty much the state of the art for the system here in about microseconds. So as I've said, uh, in some way, a spin one half is the most natural qubit because it comes naturally with two states. But as you know from basically in principle, any type of qubit, you any 2D subspace of the Hilbert space of a quantum system can define a qubit. All you need to make sure is that you're not talking to other states, or at least not doing that uncontrollably. So if you use something else than just a single spin, it has a number of advantages and disadvantages. First of all, you can use different qubits. You have a much wider choice. You can engineer so-called decoherence-free subspaces. So if there's some luck, kill or eliminate some channels of decoherence, for example, fluctuations of the broad external magnetic field. And which is most decisive, I think, reduce the control requirements. So for example, if you take two electrons, which we'll focus on, they interact with each other, so you can use that exchange interaction to manipulate the qubit and therefore have new alternatives to this Rabi control. Um, however, there's also caveats. First of all, you need to make sure that you're not leaking into 
invalid states, so into a Hilbert space dimensions that are not part of your computational subspace. And in some cases, the control sequences can become considerably more complex. So it's always a trade-off. Well, I'll start with our now two electron spin qubits, where one, again, uses a double quantum dot, as we've seen before, but now defines the two electrons as a single qubit. This gives you, uh, as additional resource, the exchange interaction. I'll tell you how that works, but basically the two spins talk to each other. It's the same thing that produced this Pauli blockade before. And the big advantage is that that can be tuned electrically. So we just apply electric pulses to these gates and can use that to manipulate the qubit. And that can be done at much lower frequencies. And these complicated single spin rotations with these lousy Rasi oscillations aren't needed anymore. Although the latest results are not so bad, actually. But. So now, all the spin states are spanned by these four states. Um, well, two spins, four states. But what we choose as computational subspace in most approaches is only the m equals 0 states, so the singlet and the t naught, which are superpositions of up, down, and down, up. So now they have zero net spin, whereas these additional states, the t plus and the t minus with parallel spins, they are there, but we don't use them to encode the qubit. And now, in a nutshell, the operations of this system look like this. To generate a precession, we use a field gradient. So if the two electrons see different fields, then the up-down and down-up states have different energies, so they acquire different phases. So that gives us uh, basically sigma z rotation, so rotation around the z-axis. On the other hand, if you look at the exchange interaction that corresponds to sigma x, if you virtually exchange the two spins that mixes these two states, and that gives rotation around the different axes, so graphically the field gradient between left and right rotates around the z-axis, and pictorially you can think of this exchange oscillation operation really exchanging two spins, mapping this state onto this one, and vice versa. It's a more intuitive picture, but you can go through the calculation in the same way and, well, and get the same result. So if you compare single spin and two electron spin qubits, you can draw a nice analogy. Here for a single spin, the up and the down state are the eigenstates. Here it depends a bit on which experiment you want to consider what is more convenient. But to make this mapping, you can think of the up-down and the down-up as the two eigenstates all of the computational states of the qubit. Here, the z, uh, level splitting is given by the external magnetic field in the z direction. Here, it's the difference in external magnetic field between the two dots, whatever way that is generated. And here, to drive the spins, we had an x field, a magnetic field. Here, we need this exchange coupling, which can be switched electrically. Once you make that identification, the principles of control are the same, and in fact, also pretty much the same for any other type of qubit. But. All right, so I think this is a good time to stop for today. So what I'll go through next time is uh, explain this energy diagram, which shows the energy dependence of all these levels in the qubit, the different states, as a function of detuning explain how that comes about and how it's used to control this qubit, and then move on to uh, coherence measurements. All right, so thank you so far. It was very interactive, and see you again tomorrow. And perhaps over lunch. <laughs> <laughs>